Thank you, Lenny. Thanks for having me. I'm very flattered to be invited. Um, my, and I'd also like to thank Dan Dewar and um, Anjali Advani and Wendy Stock for helping provide slides regarding the toxicity of, pegas, of asparaginase, um, which is the title of my talk. Um, thinking of this talk, it, I knew it was going to be hard to not be redundant with previous talks, given that um, asparaginase toxicity is such a major issue in the treatment of ALL. So th this slide shows grade three to four toxicity rates of L-asparaginase in adult front, some adult frontline trials. This is native asparaginase for the most part. Um, and the exposure, as Dr. Dewar was talking about, is fairly low in these trials. And so um, we're talking about the major toxicities. We're looking at hepatotoxicity rates in the 20% range, as well as pancreatitis and thrombosis as major complications. Peg asparaginase monotherapy um, was, at least for a short period, was studied by Edinger et al. in this phase two trial of uh, peg asparaginase monotherapy lead-in of a single dose of peg asparaginase in relapsed ALL patients age one to 20. Um, a single dose of peg asparaginase given at 20, 22,000 un international units per meter squared, um, followed by a bone marrow assessment, um, and then peg asparaginase given in combination with incristian and prednisone. Um, CR rates with the uh, single dose of peg asparaginase were actually 17% in this study and went up to almost 70% um, when combined with increasing present prednisone with or without doxorubicin. And this is the toxicity talk. So toxicity uh, with the single dose, this is just within the first 14 days. Um, hyperbilirubinemia and transaminitis being the major toxicities, but only at a rate of 5 and 10%, uh, grade 3 or 4. And in combination with chemotherapy, those numbers didn't change much. Uh, hyperbilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia is slightly higher at the 11% rate there. Dan just showed this slide, um, but it, it kind of summarizes uh, two things. As one, most of this talk will focus on pegylated asparaginase, because at least in the US, we can't use the native anymore, so we need to think about more about pegylated asparaginase. Um, and this kind of shows the significant toxicity in adults, especially in um, when increasing exposure and combining the drug with multi-agent chemotherapy. So pancreatitis rates as high as 14%, allergy rates of 6%, uh, which is obviously fairly low relative to some of the pediatric studies. Um, deep vein thrombosis of 16%, and hepatotoxicity at 63% with hyperbilirubinemia of 31%. So pretty high toxicities. Um, so the, the issues with peg asparaginase versus native asparaginase in AYA in adults is, yes, uh, the pegylated asparaginase gives you more complete and prolonged asparagine depletion. And this, as uh, Dan also showed, has improved with out, uh, improved outcomes and increased efficacy, as we saw in CLGB 9511, um, in which peg asparaginase was added to the Larsen backbone. Um, and in this, um, they defined inadequate asparaginine asparagine depletion as a uh, asparagine activity less than 0 0.3 units per uh, uh, liter, um, inferior overall survival with a hazard ratio of 2.3, and disease-free survival with a hazard ratio of 2.2 was seen in those patients who had inadequate asparagine depletion. So the increased toxicity, but the, the issue with the pegylated asparaginase is increased toxicity potentially and treatment delays, uh, which may impact relapse-free survival and as well as potentially for increased treatment-related mortality with this drug. CCG 1962 looked at pediatric patients, a randomized trial comparing pegylated asparaginase to native asparaginase, randomized 118 patients one-to-one, -one, um, and used the 1952 backbone and looked at standard risk ALL in patients aged one to nine years. So the asparaginase was applied in induction uh, with vincristine and prednisone, um, randomized, again, uh, the dose of peg asparaginase of 25,000 units per meter squared. And it was also given in delayed intensification um, in combination with incristine, dexamethasone, and doxorubicin. What they found in the study uh, was toxic, grade 3 to 4 toxicity between the two arms was very similar and low. Um, CNS events looked like they were slightly higher in the peg asparaginase arm, um, and pancreatitis was higher, slightly higher in the the peg asparaginase arm as well. Notably, with peg asparaginase in this age group, there were no abnormal LFTs reported of grade three to four, um, and very little, little to no allergy. 
So what do we learn? Um, that Pegasus baryogenase is well tolerated in one to nine year olds. Um, that toxicity is similar between the two drugs. Um, again, there was no, liver, no significant liver toxicity in the one to nine year old group. And there's more prolonged asparagine activity and um, asparaginase activity with pegasparaginase. Pegasparaginase was less likely to induce antibodies. And even with antibodies, there was less likely to be reduced activity of pegasparaginase um, um, relative to native asparaginase. Um, no difference in event-free survival and led to FDA approval of pegasparaginase in the front line. But does it apply to AYN adults? Is it safe and at what doses? Um, so the NCCN guidelines have substituted pegasparaginase out of necessity, um, but also based on the CCG data, um, into all of the adult regimens as recommendations. But it is unclear how these actually always integrate dose timing, overlap of asparagine depletion with subsequent chemotherapy courses. Um, and efficacy for asparagine depletion may be preserved, but efficacy overall <laughs> due to treatment delays, treatment-related mortality um, is, is unclear at this time. And this is just an example of how to add pegylated asparaginase to the GRAL 2003 regimen. If this was your favorite regimen, what do you do? Well, induction and late intensification is fairly straightforward. You can add a dose of a pegasparaginase to cover those eight doses and six doses of native asparaginase. However, in consolidation, which is 14-day blocks, they gave a single dose of asparaginase in blocks one and two. Um, and so adding pegasparaginase to this regimen has maybe some unforeseen consequences that uh, we don't know. Do you give pegasparaginase in block one or block two? Block two probably after high-dose methotrexate. Um, or do you use a single dose of Rowinia? I don't think we, we, we know. We don't know, I should say. Um, Back to uh, Dr. Dewar's study, um, this is going back to um, are we able to give the therapy to adults? And um, if we are able to, get, to give it, are we um, delaying other active agents too long? Um, and that might lead to, to increased relapse rates. And so pegasparaginase toxicity um, led to discontinuation in 19% of patients, and 14 cycles were delayed due to pegasparaginase toxicity all due to hepatotoxicity and principally hyperbilirubinemia. Um, so the consequences, even though we don't see fatal liver disease, the consequences down the line could be uh, huge. Um, as far as strat strategies for managing toxicity, dose reductions, um, and including dose reductions for age, uh, clinical predictors of toxicity and improved prevention, improved management, and trial designs to avoid overlapping toxicities. And early reporting of pegasparaginase toxicities, I would say, in established regimens, if there are some unforeseen toxicities um, to be discussed early. As far as dose reductions and caps, um, GMOL is uh, 072 of 2003 is a nice, is a reflective example of the if dose is actually associated well with toxicity um, sequentially over t two different cohorts over time. They looked at the do pegasparaginase dose of 1,000 versus 2,000 uh, international units per meter squared, and they saw no difference, reported no difference in uh, major toxicities, including transaminitis was 30% in both groups, hyperbilirubinemia was the same, thrombosis, bleeding, and hypersensitivity was the same. Hypersensitivity was extremely low at 1%. How about age? Well, we know there are uh, factors of asparaginase toxicity that uh, are some toxicities that increase with age. Um, it doesn't appear that allergy does in, this, in the, the pediatric uh, uh, experience in CCG 1961. Um, but rates of stroke and encephalopathy um, and hyperglycemia, kind of uh, what more asparaginase-specific uh, toxicities, uh, did increase significantly with age into uh, adolescence. How about adults? Well, the Grawl 2003 experience, they looked at their patients 15 to 45 and compared them to 46 to 60-year-olds, um, and there was an increased toxicity with age. In this case, intolerance of l asparaginase was higher in the older age group, um, and that was defined as allergy or pancreatitis. Um, thromboembolic complications were much higher in the older age group at 9.4% versus 2.9%, as well as liver toxicity. That's all in induction. In post-remission therapy, um, intolerance, intolerance of L-asparaginase um, was much, still much higher in the older age group, um, that's presumably principally from pancreatitis, um, but uh, thromboembolic complications and liver toxicity were the same. 
So I want to focus on a couple things, hepatotoxicity one and hypersensitivity, mostly because um, they're things that we may be able to um, uh, do something about moving forward. Um, the incidence of hepatotoxicity of any grade is about 80% in adult studies uh, with grade three to four of 20 to 60%. It's almost always reversible and, and almost never fatal. Um, there are no identified preventative or therapeutic interventions identified. Lots of proposed risk factors for hepatotoxicity, age being one, obesity, uh, pre-existing steatohepatitis, and there's preclinical data to support that, um, chemotherapy combinations, uh, concomitant medications, especially antifungals, azoles, um, and potentially corticosteroids. And um, is there a dose dependence to hepatotoxicity? Well, the GML data suggests no. And genetic predictors are going to be, I think, very important, um, as well as race and ethnicity, uh, diet, alcohol, and I would propose potentially malignant infiltration at the time of diagnosis. Most of these things have not been looked at well. Uh, in C10403, this is the induction toxicities. Um, we see how an older age cohort in 10403 had a hyperbilirubinemia rate of 16% uh, versus the 0232 experience in the 16 to 29 year olds, where hyperbilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia was only 7%. However, all in grade three to five hepatotoxicities at any time, and this data is not finalized, but um, Grade three to five hepatotoxicities at any time were basically the same between the two groups. So, uh, over the course of treatment, um, uh, transaminitis in 10403 and 0232 of about 50 percent, and bilirubin elevation. This is grade three to five again of 22, 23, and 24 percent between the two trials. So, age did not seem to make as big a difference over time. Maybe just an induction in, this, in uh, uh, with asparaginase. And uh, the USC phase two, again, uh, with uh, uh, increased asparaginase uh, exposure uh, with multiple doses on a modified uh, augmented pediatric BFM uh, backbone, um, six doses of PEG asparaginase given in the context of prednisone, um, and in uh, um, intensification, also high dose methotrexate. And we, we saw this from Dan. Uh, high rates of transaminitis, 63%, and hyperbilirubinemia, 31%. And by cycle, what was interesting in the study is that in induction, um, almost 20% of patients had grade three or four hyperbilirubinemia. But in subsequent cycles, the total uh, was only 10%, um, probably saying, possibly saying something about the biology of the asparaginase toxicity um, and the contents of active leukemia versus um, later. Um, the only cycle that kind of was different was intensification one, again, in the context of high-dose methotrexate. might explain some of that elevation. However, intensification two, that wasn't seen. So as far as prevention or amelioration of hepatotoxicity, um, we don't have any good answers yet. Um, certainly risk stratification with imaging may be a good approach, and um, we're trying to add that, to, or Dr. Litzow is trying to add that to the E1910 trial with MRI imaging of the liver um, to uh, at least study prospectively the effect of steatohepatitis on rates of hepatotoxicity and potentially looking at leukemic involvement as well. Um, L-carnitine has pr been proposed as a, a possible treatment for hepatotoxicity or, or maybe a prophylactic, uh, milk thistle and ursodiol. And as far as treatment, it's supportive care, um, removal of contributing medications, and dose reductions or discontinuations of uh, the asparaginase, um, if necessary. Um, and L-carnitine, um, again, has been proposed and possibly ursodile. So this is a patient that I treated who developed hepatotoxicity after um, his first dose of pegylated asparaginase um, in, this, in this protocol, which is the... Uh, UC Hemolignancies Consortium protocol, uh, the first dose of PEG asparaginase, very similar induction to what uh, the USC induction um, is given on day 16. This patient developed a severe transaminitis uh, several days after receiving uh, PEG asparaginase, and you see that bi biphasic peak on his ALT, the blue line, uh, which we'll get back to in a second. And so ba this paper looked at uh, a model of uh, asparaginase-induced liver toxicity in, in the setting of steatohepatitis. 
um, and looked at the effects of L-carnitine. Um, they looked at four um, parameters, um, liver parameters for toxicity, and that was portal venous pressure, oxygen consumption, AST, and LDH, LDH being very similar to AST, ALT in the rat, apparently. Um, so in normal mice and uh, normal control mice with a normal liver, non-steatotic liver, and control versus receiving asparaginase, there was no difference in any of these parameters. So there was no liver toxicity. When they induced steatohepatitis, however, and gave asparaginase, that's the third, third uh, column in each of those uh, slides, um, they saw fairly substantial liver toxicity uh, with increased portal venous pressure, increased oxygen consumption, elevation of AST, and elevation of LDH. And what was notable is they gave these, if they gave these rats L-carnitine, it can almost completely reverse that process. And when they looked at the, this is a little very pixelated, I'm sorry. Uh, when they gave the, uh, when they looked at the, the livers of these mice, um, on the top there are the normal control and the, the treated mouse, asparaginase treated normal liver, um, the livers look normal. Um, in a steatotic liver on the, the, the uh, second uh, uh, row there, um, the steatotic liver, the administration of asparaginase increased the steatosis in the liver and was associated with those, those other findings. However, L-carnitine nearly completely reversed to this, this steatotic process. So given the low to zero toxicity of L-carnitine, decided to go ahead and administer it. It's fairly cheap. Um, and at the peak of that ALT, just after that, he started an L-carnitine, and his ALT and AST came down almost immediately. Um, I have alkaline phosphatase and bilirubin on here, too. They actually didn't change. Um, he started to rise a bit again, so I said, well, it's, maybe it's not working so well, so I just stopped it, and his ALT jumped up again, so restarted it at that second arrow, and his ALT and AST dropped quickly. Um, no effect on alkaline phosphatase and T-bili. Um, there are several other case reports of similar findings um, of improvement in the liver parameters after L-carnitine, which are being prepared for publication, I think. So to move on, hypersensitivity is another potentially modifiable toxicity of pegylated asparaginase. Um, the incidence is wide, 1 to 30 percent um, in pediatric and adult studies. Uh, it's not fully understood why, but um, age doesn't appear to be that based on, the, appear to have an effect based on the 1961 study. Um, the context of peg asparaginase administration is probably crucial. And so it's the, the context of other agents in combination with pegasparaginase that's going to make a difference, as well as the genetics of the hosts. Hypersensitivity, the consequences are dose hold cycle delays, uh, potentially asparaginase activation, although with pegasparaginase that might not be as big a problem um, as we saw in CCG 1962 and uh, some of the data that uh, Dr. Dewar just presented. Um, substitution or elimination of asparaginase. Um, and trial designs to reduce or eliminate hypersensitivity may improve adherence to protocol and max maximize uh, asparagine depletion. And hypersensitivity correlates with antibody formation, but antibody formation is not predictive in all regimens. In CCG 1962, there was no significant allergy, yet approximately 40% of native L asparaginase and 15% of peg asparaginase treated patients developed antibodies. Um, with decreased allergy, silent inactivation uh, may be unrecognized in patients. So if we get better control over this, uh, better screening for asparagine activity um, may be indicated. As far as strategies to reduce hypersensitivity, pre-medication uh, with corticosteroids, high-dose methotrexate, anti-B cell antibodies, and genetic predictors may all have a role. So in the pediatric experience of uh, asparaginase hypersensitivity, um, comparing CCG 1961 and 1962, in 1961, um, after induction, uh, patients were randomized to either standard or intensified uh, post-induction therapy. In the standard arm um, dose intensification, asparaginase was given after dexamethasone as well as bincristine and doxorubicin. In the intensified arm, a lot more asparaginase, peg asparaginase. Um, with only in, the, the, uh, in uh, the delayed intensification one and two, it was given in the context of dexamethasone. 
but in other cycles it was not given um, in the context of a steroid or high-dose methotrexate or a B cell anti-B cell antibody. And the allergy incidence in this study was 24 uh, to 29 percent, dependent on the age, and it was as high as 54 percent in the intensified arm um, during delayed intensification, so very high rates of hypersensitivity. Uh, CCG 1962, however, um, gave all of its asparagine, uh, asparaginase in the context of corticosteroids, either prednisone or dexamethasone, and its allergy incidence was very low, less than 2%. Similarly, um, in the USC trial, um, by design, um, every asparaginase dose was given in the context of prednisone, and some doses were also given in the context of high-dose methotrexate. Um, and the allergy incidence was only 6%. So again, very low. And looking at the CLGB10403 experience, um, which again is very similar to, um, directly comparable to 0232 in the, in the pediatric population, um, all the post-induction doses of pegylated asparaginase, except for again in delayed intensification, uh, were given um, in cycles that did not contain corticosteroid or high-dose methotrexate. And due to high rates of hypersensitivity in this study, the protocol was actually amended to include hydrocortisone uh, 100 milligrams prior to each dose of pegasparaginase. And what was seen with that is the allergic reaction rate went way down in 10403. Um, they were seeing rates um, comparable to 0232, which had a 19% hypersensitivity rate, um, down to 7.9% after the amendment that included corticosteroids, very similar to the rates seen in other trials that include steroids. The, the GMOL 07-2003 experience was, a, was is different. Um, the post-induction doses of asparaginase, pegylated asparaginase in this case, are all given after high-dose methotrexate. And this has probably the lowest hypersensitivity rate of any of the trials. Um, Less than 1%, I think, now in their retrospective look at things. So this, um, so this suggests that high-dose methotrexate may nearly eliminate hypersensitivity um, without the use of concomitant corticosteroids. In the uh, University of California Heme Malignancies Consortium 1401 study, uh, which just uh, is just opening, um, also termed the California Protocol by Archie Blyer, um, is um, is looking, it's, is attempting to study hypersensitivity and ways of reducing it as well. Um, the induction course 1A, as well as delayed intensification 2A, um, pegasparaginase is given after prednisone. In the, the B um, consolidation courses, pegasparaginase is given after high dose methotrexate. And in maintenance, there is one additional dose of pegasparaginase to get to six doses of pegasparaginase given in, in the context of pump maintenance. Um, which may potentially expose more patients to a risk of hypersensitivity. Within this, within this trial, we actually have a double-blind randomization to hydrocortisone versus placebo prior to each peg asparaginase dose in the B courses and maintenance month one. Um, the, it's not going to be a huge trial, so the, if we may not see any effect. Um, but, but overall, we're trying to assess whether the hyper, what the hypersensitivity rates will be with these different approaches. As far as genetic predictors of hypersensitivity, um, a couple of genes have been identified. Um, Chan et al. Uh, looked at over 500,000 SNPs and 485 children in two cohorts of patients with uh, pediatric ALL uh, treated with asparaginase, and they found that chromosome 5 was overrepresented in allergic patients in the discovery cohort uh, with a high p-value with 10 SNPs annotated to genes. And when they looked closer, they, saw, they found that one SNP in GRIA1, which is glutamate receptor 1, it was replicated in the validation cohort, and this area has also been a hot spot in other allergies. HLA-DRB1-0701 um, has more recently been implicated in uh, asparaginase hypersensitivity. Um, patients with this allele have a higher incidence of hypersensitivity uh, with an odds ratio of 1.6, and, and anti-asparaginase antibodies with an odds ratio of 2.9. So, um, which may be even more useful moving forward if we're able to control hypersensitivity to be able to predict patients who may actually um, develop anti-asparaginase antibodies and get higher, higher risk for silent inactivation. 
They also looked at in silico uh, to predict high affinity HLA DRB1 alleles for asparaginase epitopes, um, and those that had high affinity for asparaginase epitopes had more allergy. So Erwinia asparaginase um, in our hypersensitivity, hypersensitive patients is uh, clearly a recommendation. Frontline trials of this drug uh, failed to show superiority over E. coli asparaginase, so EORTC um, 5881 um, looked at untreated pediatric patients less than 18 years and randomized between E. coli and Erwinia asparaginase given at 10,000 units uh, per meter squared twice weekly. Um, CR rates, relapse rates, and six-year overall survival uh, were superior with the E. coli formulation. In the Dana-Farber 9501 study, again, pediatric patients less than 19, randomized between E. coli and Erwinia, 25,000 units once in induction and once weekly in intensification. Five-year event-free survival was lower with Erwinia, 78% versus 89% with E. coli, uh, with increased relapse. And toxicity and hypersensitivity were lower with Erwinia, um, but based on the, the pharmacokinetics of Erwinia, it's not surprising that you have both less activity and less toxicity, as this was given at the same doses as E. coli, which is probably inappropriate for Erwinia if you want the same level of asparagine depletion. So decreased efficacy and toxicity, again, likely due to lack of sustained asparagine depletion with Erwinia. And given results to date, Erwinia is restricted to patients with hypersensitivity to E. coli asparaginase for now. And the short half-life necessitates frequent dosing at least three times weekly and doses of 20,000 um, units per meter squared have been recommended. As far as reducing hypersensitivity, uh, to summarize, corticosteroids, I think, clearly appear to reduce uh, the incidence of hypersensitivity. There are very low rates of hypersensitivity uh, when uh, doses of, subsequent doses of pegasparaginase after induction are ad administered after high-dose methotrexate. The utility of genetic testing is unclear if trial design is unable to eliminate toxicity, but it may help risk stratify patients to pre-medication or regimen selection. It may also help us select patients that need more intensive screening for antibodies looking for silent inactivation. Um, and the role of anti-B cell antibodies is uh, to be explored, um, but, but theoretically they should improve all of these things, including hypersensitivity and the production of uh, anti-asparaginase antibodies. I'm just going to touch briefly because there's, I think, less controversy and pretty straightforward management for some of the other um, uh, complications. Pancreatitis, um, criteria have not been well defined in trials, but the incidence is about 48, 18% in pediatrics, and grade 3 to 4 is about 4 to 14% in adult patients. It's usually with the first dose. It typically recurs after retreatment, so it necessitates stopping the drug entirely. Um, and age is a possible risk factor. And clinical and genetic predictors are needed for this one. Uh, management is supportive in stopping the drug. And for thrombosis, grade 3 to 4 thrombosis rate is 5 to 16% in adult trials. Um, AT3, um, antithrombin, and fibrinogen depletion is common, and up to 90% of patients treated with asparaginase. And the role of monitoring and repletion of factors is still unclear. It's obviously it's clinically feasible to do. Um, you can test these levels and replete, replete AT3 to try to prevent thrombosis or to use it in the setting of active thrombosis. Um, but it's not unclear if outcomes are changed. Thank you.